Okay, so uh, first of all, I want to thank everybody here, really. Thank you to the organizers. This is really one of the best conferences I've ever been to in my life. This is amazing, so I really appreciate you putting all of the work you put into organizing it and uh, to including in the program. I really appreciate that. And the past few days of talks have been amazing, too, so thanks to all of the other speakers and participants. So what I want to talk about, in a way, will I hope be complementary to many of the other talks in the sense that this talk is a sort of abstract, big picture uh, survey of many of the issues that come up with respect to animals and climate change, both uh, farmed animals and climate change and wild animals and climate change. So my talk will touch on, without going into as much detail about, many of the issues that people have already talked about. So, so my approach will not be to try to argue for uh, rigorous, systematic answers to any particular question, but rather survey all of those questions, explore those questions, explore how they interact, and then try to demonstrate how their interaction can pretty radically change how we think we ought to approach problems concerning animals and climate change, all things considered. So the talk, I should say, also is uh, based on a chapter I wrote uh, on this topic for a book on philosophy and climate change that Mark is co-editing. And I'll now be expanding it into a book, which will come out in about four years. So I have a lot of time to work on it. So part of what I want to do in this conference is, is workshop some of my current thinking about how to frame these issues and integrate these issues and then see what advice people have about what I should look at or how I should rethink anything. So maybe if you could keep that in mind and we could talk about that too, either in the Q&A or later on, that would be really helpful for me. OK, great. So, my general thesis in this project is that animals, not human animals, are central to climate change, and so they should also be central to climate mitigation and adaptation. So in particular, animal agriculture is a major contributor to climate change, and so resistance to animal agriculture should be a major part of climate mitigation. And climate change will be a major contributor to wild animal suffering, and so assistance for wild animals should be a major part of climate adaptation. Now, as I said, this raises a lot of really interesting and challenging empirical as well as philosophical questions regarding the nature and scope of well-being, creation ethics, population ethics, and duties to future generations, the limits of ethics and politics. And so, again, rather than uh, answer any of these questions decisively, I really want to explore them all holistically and show how our answers to them might affect our answers to other questions and affect our overall orientation towards this issue. But I will argue for a couple of uh, relatively speaking modest provisional conclusions. So in particular, I will argue that um, we do have prima facie moral reason to incorporate resistance to animal agriculture and assistance uh, for wild animals into our climate response, and that our first steps should be extending moral and political standing to all sentient beings, as I said, relatively modest, <laughs> uh, extending moral and political standing to all sentient beings and researching interventions in animal agriculture and wild animal suffering. So this will be a, a, a quick survey in, in some of those issues, uh, starting with farmed animals and climate change, then going to wild animals and climate change, and then going to some of the broader philosophical questions that get implicated in these discussions, followed by some brief conclusions. So first of all, farmed animals and climate change. As I said, and I think everybody in the room knows this, uh, farmed animals, and in particular animal agriculture, farmed animals through no fault of their own, uh, are major contributors to climate change. Uh, and this is happening against the background of other related shifts, including an increase in human population and an increase in consumption per capita driven in part by industrialization. So uh, at 1900, we had about 1.5 billion humans on the planet. That went up to about 2.5 billion at 1950. It went up to about 7 billion a little bit after the turn of the century. Population experts now predict that the human population will hit 9 or 10 billion by 2050 and 10 or 11 billion by 2100. So that means we have a lot more humans. Uh, humans are also consuming a lot more per capita, and in particular, humans are consuming a lot more non-human animal bodies and products per capita than we ever have before. So humans are currently farming uh, over 20 billion terrestrial animals at any given time, 
many, many more aquatic animals than that, and the aquatic numbers are increasing. And of course, given how intensive industrial animal agriculture is, we also have to invest a lot of land and water and energy that we consume in general to this industry. So industrial animal agriculture is responsible not only for massive amounts of domesticated animal suffering and public health risks, though that too, but also very significant environmental impacts and climate impacts. So as of about a decade ago, those impacts add up to an estimated 9% of global carbon emissions, 37% of global methane emissions, and 65% of global nitrous oxide emissions. So what does that mean in general? We're here, estimates vary wildly, including the estimates that people cite in authoritative ways. Uh, so, so one widely cited estimate is that industrial animal agriculture and animal agriculture more generally is responsible for 14.5% of global anthropogenic greenhouse gas emissions. Another is that industrial animal agriculture and animal agriculture more generally is responsible for 51% of global anthropogenic greenhouse gas emissions. So the first number is an update to a 2006 FAO estimate, which was originally 18%. Uh, and the second number, popularized by the documentary Cowspiracy, is based on a 2009 World Watch report that was a critical response to the FAO report. Why do the estimates vary so widely? Well, in part they make different assumptions about the total number of animals being farmed and about which impact So the 14.5% uh, estimate focuses on a 100 year time frame of climate impacts and the 51% estimate focuses on a 20 year time frame of climate impacts. And this matters because carbon lasts much longer in the atmosphere than methane or nitrous oxide, but methane and nitrous oxide trap heat much more effectively than carbon while in the atmosphere. So in particular, methane traps heat 23 times as effectively as carbon, and nitrous oxide traps heat 296 times as effectively as carbon. So since carbon lasts in the atmosphere longer, and since animal agriculture is responsible for a higher proportion of methane and nitrous oxide than carbon, focusing on a 20-year time frame really amplifies or, or highlights the impacts of animal agriculture on the climate, whereas focusing on a 100-year time frame really amplifies the relative impacts of other human industries. So which of these is the right way of looking at it? Well, both are accurate in a way, and it really depends on what our purposes are in collecting and presenting this information to people. I think what matters for our purposes is that if either of these is accurate, or if we assume for the sake of argument that both amplify the impacts and actually animal agriculture is responsible for 10% of global greenhouse gas emissions. This is still a major contribution relative to other food systems to human-caused climate change. And that has moral implications. In particular, if animal agriculture is a major contributor to human-caused climate change, then resistance to animal agriculture should be a major part of climate mitigation. So we, of course, already have moral re reason to resist animal agriculture on animal welfare grounds, on public health grounds, on worker grounds, but now we have this reason too, so it uh, strengthens the case. And in particular, I want to make two claims. The first is that we have prima facie moral reason, uh, so, so strong but defeasible, perhaps moral reason, to resist animal agriculture individually through <coughs> activism, advocacy, and philanthropy that promotes alternative food systems. Uh, and the second claim I want to make is that we also have prima facie moral reason to resist animal agriculture collectively through public policy that promotes alternative food systems. Now, people in both the animal but especially the environmental movements have been a little bit slow to accept these results, and there are interesting questions about why that is. I want to focus on a couple of objections that I think are reasonable objections, but say why I think we have reason to question these objections and push back against them. The first is a pragmatic objection about our individual obligation to focus on animal agriculture in the environmental movement. I think people are concerned that if we focus on what we eat, and in particular if we focus on vegan advocacy, then we might alienate people from the environmental movement, and we might slow the growth and the overall impact of the environmental movement as a result. 
But I think that this impact might not occur, <coughs> and even if it does, it might be warranted. So first of all, there are plenty of ways of engaging in vegan advocacy and advocacy that promotes alternative food systems that are not alienating, that would not alienate people from the environmental movement. So for example, insofar as you focus on uh, structural, uh, social, political, and economic circumstances is the problem, and structural, social, political, and economic change is the solution, rather than individual behavior as the problem, and individual behavioral change is the solution, people are not as alienated by that kind of structural approach. Second of all, insofar as you take a conciliatory approach to your activism and advocacy, and you invite people to participate in Meatless Mondays, and you praise them for doing so, uh, then even if you do focus on individual behavior and individual behavioral change, that is less alienating for people. So, so there are ways of engaging in vegan advocacy in the context of the environmental movement that I think would not actually be uh, very alienating at all. And, and so, so if we are concerned about alienation, we can of course focus on these approaches and be okay. But second of all, even if vegan advocacy and advocacy against industrial animal agriculture is alienating to people in the environmental movement, that might be warranted because, of course, a relatively speaking smaller and slower growing movement that focuses on the right issues and focuses on them in effective and impactful ways can have a greater impact overall than a relatively speaking larger or faster growing movement that focuses on the wrong issues or focuses on issues in ineffective and counterproductive ways. This is often the spirit with which uh, uh, radically um, political uh, uh, radicals uh, criticize uh, moderate and mainstream animal and environmental movements. They think that those movements are growing at the expense of watering down their message and making it ineffective and counterproductive. So I think that we can engage in vegan advocacy in non-alienating ways, and I also think that insofar as we do engage in vegan advocacy in alienating ways, that can still be best for the environmental movement overall. Now another concern that people might have is that, uh, and this is re regarding food policy that promotes alternatives to animal agriculture in particular, is that it might interfere with individual liberty and therefore violate individual rights, in particular a right to eat what we like. But once again, I think that this might not be what happens, and even if it is, it might be completely warranted. First of all, it might not be what happens because a lot of the relevant policies that people would be trying to push through would not, in fact, meaningfully limit food choice. A lot of the relevant policy options on the table are things like shifting taxes and subsidies so that they relatively disincentivize uh, conventional meat animal agriculture and incentivize alternatives to animal agriculture. That shifts our incentive structure, but it does not take away from our options. Now, some of us might think that we should go farther than that and actually very strictly regulate animal agriculture or even abolish animal agriculture in a way that genuinely would restrict individual liberty, but that might be morally warranted because, of course, in general, we think that individual liberty ought to be restricted in circumstances when exercising individual liberty harms others. So this is the harm principle, which is often applied in order to justify policy choices that restrict individual liberty. Now, there are interesting questions to ask here about whether our individual activity needs to be individually harmful or collectively <coughs> harmful in order for the harm principle to apply an infringement on individual liberty to be justified. We can talk about that later if you want. I think there's a reasonable case to be made for the conclusion that collective harm is sufficient for application of the harm principle and infringement on individual liberty. Um, in any case, I think that we have good uh, starter replies to some of the main concerns people would have about centering resistance to animal agriculture uh, in our climate mitigation efforts. For the sake of uh, uh, time, I want to leave that there and move on to the topic of wild animals and climate change, which is, if anything, a much more complicated topic. Okay, so wild animals and climate change. Um, in the same way that animal agriculture is a major contributor to climate change, climate change will be a major contributor to wild animal suffering, and in the same way that the uh, first trend is happening against the background of a rise in human population and a rise in consumption per capita and 
increased industrialization. Similarly, the, the second trend will be happening against the background of what many people, including people in this room, have called the Anthropocene or the Capitalocene, defined as a geological <coughs> epoch, defined in terms of the impact that humanity or capitalism, <coughs> depending on your framework of choice, will be having on the planet. So human activity is already systematically impacting nature, impacting wild animal lives, and climate change is not going to initiate that, but it will very dramatically intensify it. So climate change is going to up the ante for our impact on natural systems on this planet. Okay. So what will the impacts be? Well, there are different uh, impacts that will be relevant for different people based on your moral framework of choice. So for ecocentrists who care primarily about the impacts on species and ecosystems, um, the, the fairly well known at this point species and ecosystems impacts are probably going to be negative, right? I mean, there are interesting questions about what it, what it is for things to go well or badly for an ecosystem. Um, but we can set that aside for present purposes because climate change is going to absolutely decimate uh, natural species and ecosystems. There will be mass extinction and ecosystem collapse. Things are going to get very bad for uh, the species and ecosystems that currently live on this planet. Well, what about for sentientists? What about for people who think that individual sentient beings are the primary subjects of moral concern? That question has... Uh, not been explored as much yet, although many people are starting to explore it now, including some of the people who have been speaking at this conference. And that question is also really hard to answer or to derive answers uh, from information about species and ecosystems. Because of course, species can go extinct, and that might not necessarily be bad for individuals in the aggregate, because if species go extinct, other species might expand and take their place. And there might be the same or a greater number of individuals living maybe good, maybe bad lives. So the relevant question for sentientists is, who will be the winners and losers in a world reshaped by climate change? And what kinds of lives do they live? What quality of life do they tend to have, these types of individuals? So we talked about that a bit in the previous session, in an Oscar session. Um, Unfortunately, I think we'd all agree that we don't have clear information about what the answer to this question is right now. There are a lot of uncertainties. Um, but here are a few things that we can say that are you know, informed, speculative, educated guesses about general trends we might see. So one general trend we might see is that climate change might result in a higher ratio of R strategists to K strategists. So we've now talked about our strategy and K strategy in, in two of the other se uh, sessions, our strategists are animals whose reproductive strategy uh, uh, focuses on quantity over quality, K strategists are animals whose reproductive strategy focuses on uh, quality over quantity. I will consider retiring those labels after this talk, but I committed because of the handout for now. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so as we saw uh, earlier today, our strategists tend to be more resilient in rapidly changing environmental conditions because they have shorter lifespans, they reproduce more quickly, they have a greater number of babies. Um, so they tend to do better all else equal when things are changing very rapidly. Um, though another change that we might see is climate change might also benefit uh, uh, adaptive generalists over niche specialists. So adaptive generalists are animals um, who can adapt to many different environmental circumstances. So they might, for example, do better with assisted migration. Niche specialists are animals who require a very specific type of environmental condition in order to, to live and flourish. They might do less well with things like assisted migration. Now, to a, a degree, those trends might push against each other because many adaptive generalists are case strategists and many niche specialists are R strategists, but they won't fully cancel each other out. So we could, over time, see uh, generally higher ratios of our strategists and adaptive generalists. Um, so that will raise questions about what kind of quality of life they have relative to each other, which I'll talk about in uh, uh, a little bit. Um, so, so with that said, what are uh, some of the interventions that we could consider? Well, we've also now, thanks to Duncan and Nicola, talked a lot about that. I can briefly summarize some of the options. There is vaccination, uh, population control, assisted migration, if we want to get more uh, ambitious and hubristic 
uh, and arrogant, uh, we can consider uh, bioengineering and geoengineering. Uh, though, though, as we've seen, we have reason to be extremely epistemically cautious and humble when it comes to especially those kinds of interventions. Right now, we are in the early days, so we can carry out some but not all of these interventions in effective ways if we do it in local, small-scale ways. But we're not yet in a place where we can carry out any of these interventions in uh, uh, ambitious, large-scale ways. Um, so, so we would have a lot of research we would need to do in order to get to that place. But the point for now is that um, climate change is going to have impacts on wild animal populations, many of which with further research could be foreseeable or predictable. And then with further research, there could be interventions available that could help us mitigate some of those harms insofar as we decide they are harms. So my claim, which is tentative, is that if climate change is going to be a major contributor to wild animal suffering, and if we decide that those are harms, and if we decide that we do in fact have effective, reliable ways of intervening in those harms, uh, then we ought to make assistance for wild animals part of our climate uh, adaptation strategy. Now I want to emphasize that while I personally feel sympathetic with the general duty to intervene in wild animal suffering, I'm not making that general claim here. I'm making the more particular claim that we have a moral duty to intervene in climate related, i.e. partly human caused, wild animal suffering. I think that changes the nature of the moral problem a little bit, at least for people who have certain types of background moral theories. So uh, as an illustration though, I grant that these are not the only two types of theories that we should be talking about, uh, but for purposes of simplicity. Um, consider a consequentialist and a rights theorist uh, argument for the conclusion that we have a moral duty to intervene in climate-related wild animal suffering. So a consequentialist will think about this in roughly effective altruist terms. The question will be, what is the scale, neglectedness, and tractability of this issue? Here, I think, uh, this wild animal suffering, including climate-related wild animal suffering, is clearly a massive problem. Everybody agrees with this. There are trillions or potentially quintillions of wild animals living on the planet, depending on which wild animals you choose to include, whose lives and well-beings are at stake here. So this is a massive problem. This is also a neglected problem in both the animal and environmental protection movements. Farmed animal advocacy receives less than 1% of donations relative to companion animals in the animal protection community, and wild animals receive even less attention and support than farmed animals. So you can imagine how utterly neglected climate-related wild animal suffering currently is in the animal movement. I believe climate-related wild animal suffering is also uh, quite neglected in the environmental movement, though I have zero data to, <laughs> to back that up. Um, as for tractability, well, uh, uh, Oscar um, and Duncan and Nicola and a bunch of other people have weighed in on this. I basically agree with them that uh, the jury is out on that question, but given the scale and neglectedness of this issue, given how much is at stake, uh, I think that we do have reason to invest resources in researching interventions in climate-related wild animal suffering so that we can make a more informed decision when the time comes about what, if anything, we might be able to responsibly do. Um, so I think that the consequentialist case for investing resources in laying the groundwork for eventual solutions to this problem is quite strong. Now what about rights theory? Well, rights theorists, as you all know, have generally been less willing than consequentialists to countenance the possibility that we might have a moral obligation to intervene in wild animal suffering. Uh, and I think part of that is due to an emphasis on respecting wild animal autonomy, and part of that is based on uh, an emphasis on the, the moral relevance of the doing-allowing distinction. But I think the fact that a lot of future wild animal suffering will be a result of climate change changes that entirely for a rights theorist. Moving forward, we will be complicit via climate change and other human activities in everything that happens to wild animals, uh, and, and certainly some things more than others. And what that means is that the choice situation for a rights theorist is no longer inaction versus beneficent intervention, no longer doing nothing and letting them be versus uh, 
uh, doing them a favor and helping them out, as far as you can tell. The choice situation is instead relatively uh, maleficent intervention versus rel relatively non-maleficent or reparative intervention. So, so we are intervening through our activity either way. So either the intervention is going to be human industry alone, or it will be human industry plus our efforts to mitigate those harms through interventions that prevent some of them, or provide reparations for those harms through interventions that follow them. But either way, that is now the choice situation. And I think that changes both the autonomy consideration, because the autonomy is already being interfered with, though I know that we have some reason to think that it's not all or nothing. Um, and it changes the doing allowing distinction, because now what we're doing is trying to mitigate some of the harms of what we are doing to animals or repairing them for what we have done to them. And that is a different type of consideration. OK. Um, so, so those are some consequentialist and rights theorist uh, arguments in favor of intervention in climate-related wild animal suffering. I now want to note um, that if we have these duties, we have them arguably at the individual and the collective level as we do with our duties to resist animal agriculture. So individually, I think we ought to support um, uh, this type of research and this type of work through activism and advocacy and philanthropy. So, so we should be doing activism and <coughs> advocacy uh, that, that tries to extend moral and political standing to wild animals. And we should also be doing uh, philanthropy that supports research and in interventions in wild animal suffering. And then politically, this is a more controversial claim, um, but politically I really do believe that independently, if wild animals have moral standing, then we ought to extend political standing to them anyway. But especially if wild animals are being systematically harmed by our, our, our activity, then we especially ought to extend political standing to them uh, and then treat them as we would treat any other political community being systematically harmed in part by our own behavior. So I think morally we ought to advocate for that. Uh, individually we ought to advocate for that political standing and we ought to invest in, in research in interventions in climate related wild animal suffering. And states should start the process of extending political rights, political standing to wild animal communities uh, so that we can then have the political structures in place to, for example, bring them in as climate refugees as we would human communities or um, provide aid to them where they are at uh, insofar as we want to support them in their own communities. Again, as we would ideally do with human communities, depending on who our current leaders are <laughs> and what their priorities are. Uh, okay, good. So, so those are some initial prima facie arguments. I think these arguments are quite strong, though I haven't definitively established them here. Um, but what they mean concretely in terms of what we should do is going to depend on our answers to a lot of further questions, as we've seen in, in many of the uh, sessions and especially the discussion periods at this conference. And what I want to do is illustrate that by focusing on a few different clusters of issues that become immediately relevant here, uh, any one of which can systematically reshape what we think we ought to be doing, all things considered, in light of these arguments. Uh, and then even more complicatedly, they interact with each other in, in surprising ways. So the first is uh, the topic of well-being, the nature and scope of well-being. So climate change is going to impact wild animal populations systematically. Um, but whether those impacts will be good or bad on the whole depends in part on what theory of well-being we accept, uh, and in part on who we think has well-being, and in part on whether we think their lives are good or bad. So, so take each of these questions. First of all, uh, what theory of well-being do we accept? Well, uh, as, as we, we noted at the very end of the last session, um, if you accept an objectivist theory of well-being, for example, you have more options for saying that animals can have good or bad lives. There are more ways in which animals could have good or bad lives. Whereas if you accept a subjectivist theory of well-being, like a hedonist theory, pleasure, pain, or a desire, satisfaction, frustration theory, you have fewer ways in which a life can be good or bad. Uh, so that will impact how you assess these things, as we saw with Mark's calculations. 
Um, when it comes to who has well-being, this is also a really challenging and contested question. So on a standard, say, subjectivist pleasure, pain, desire satisfaction view, we have very strong reason, behavioral, physiological, and evolutionary, to think that all vertebrates, including fish, have subjective well-being at this point. They have enough of the behavior, enough of the physiology, and enough uh, shared evolutionary history, but less of that, for us to be relatively confident about that, unless we want to go in for radical skepticism about other minds in general, in which case all bets are off. Um, but we have less reason, though some reason, to think that many vertebrates uh, are sentient, experience pleasure and pain, and have desires or preferences in the relevant sense. The behavioral evidence is quite strong. Uh, in some cases of invertebrates, the physiological evidence is very strong. In other cases, the physiological evidence is mixed. Uh, the evolutionary evidence is quite mixed, too. So I think that this is undeniably a site of risk and uncertainty, where <coughs> because of the philosophical issues at play, we will never have enough confidence about certain borderline cases. So, so we need to be thoughtful about how to treat individuals in, in these cases of risk and uncertainty. Similarly, do these individuals have good or bad lives? Well, that depends on a whole lot of things. It depends on the empirical information. I think a lot of people are overly optimistic about how good things are for wild animals, maybe because they have good reason to be, but maybe because they also focus a little bit too much on charismatic megafauna lying out in the savanna, and not enough on the you know, millions of our strategists who die within minutes of coming into sentience, painful deaths. Um, but it also depends on philosophical issues, including where we set the baseline for a life worth living. Does it mean more good than bad? Does it mean a certain baseline of good above zero? A certain baseline below zero? Those are challenging philosophical questions. Um, all I'll say there is that we do have some reason to think that certain types of animals have richer experiences than others. And again, this goes to the previous session. So we do have reason to think that K strategists have richer experiences than our strategists, especially insects. And if that assumption is correct, then if climate change causes a higher ratio of R to K strategists, that could be really morally significant. So suppose all animals have good lives. Suppose that for the sake of argument. Then a higher ratio of R to K strategists would mean uh, total well-being goes up and average well-being goes down. We have a real life repugnant conclusion on our hands. Suppose all animals have bad lives. Then that would mean that um, total well-being goes down and average well-being goes up. Then of course if climate change causes an increase in, or decrease in the total number of animals, uh, independently of those ratio adjustments, we have to factor that in too. So real population ethics questions are going to come up here. Um, now as I said, I think that ultimately we have a lot of uncertainty here. And so what we should do in these cases is use principles of risk and uncertainty to ask and answer questions about how to treat animals about whose sentience or about whose capacity for well-being we are uncertain. Now normally when people think about the ethics of risk and uncertainty, they think about precautionary principles that tell you to err on the side of caution and expected value principles that tell you to multiply your subjective probability that a certain outcome will occur uh, by the nature of that outcome. So in this case, interestingly, if we accept either one of those principles, they would instruct us to treat animals at the boundaries of sentience as at least partly sentient. So a precautionary principle would tell us to err on the side of caution, treat invertebrates and insects as sentient then some of Mark's wackier conclusions come into play. Uh, an expected value principle will maybe be a little bit more moderate, but, but still quite radical. So there are an estimated 10 quintillion insects in the world at any given time, 10 quintillion. So even if you make extremely conservative assumptions about their likelihood of being sentient and about how sentient they would be, the total amount of well-being at stake uh, expectedly would still be equivalent to billions and billions and billions and billions of primates. So on either one of these principles of risk and uncertainty, we ought to treat animals at the boundaries of sentience, as far as we can tell, as at least partly sentient. And then their well-being ends up mattering a lot, I believe.
Now, when it comes to who has good or bad lives, these principles of risk and uncertainty provide less concrete guidance because we first have to answer certain questions in creation ethics or population ethics in order to know where the risks truly lie here. So let's talk about that for a few minutes. Okay. So the next cluster of, of issues is in creation ethics, population ethics, and duties to future generations. This is, of course, relevant because most of the impacts that climate change will have on non-human animals will occur to future generations of non-human animals. So we have to ask questions about the ethics of bringing beings into existence, what kind of populations are ideal, and what we owe to beings in the future as opposed to beings at present. So take creation ethics first. One question people often ask in this domain is, do we have stronger moral reason to not bring about bad lives than we have to bring about good lives? Consequentialist utilitarians tend to say no, we have equal reason to promote good things as to prevent bad things. But many other people say yes, they think we do have stronger reason to prevent bad things, um, or at least not cause bad things, than we have to promote good things. And so they think we have stronger reason not to bring about bad lives than we have to promote good lives. Some people even think that we have zero reason to promote or bring about good lives. Now, if you think that, and if you think there is some uncertainty about whether wild animals have good or bad lives, then you should think principles of risk and uncertainty instruct us to err on the side of not bringing into existence certain wild animal populations or reducing the numbers of certain wild animal populations. So that'll end up affecting how we apply principles of risk and uncertainty to questions about well-being. Now think about some questions in population ethics. One is the non-identity problem. This is a problem that uh, Derek Parfit named, and this refers to the problem that arises when you observe that many of our activities affect not only the quality of life, but also the very identities of many individuals who will live in the future. So what we do now will determine not only how things go for future wild animals, but also which future wild animals are going to exist. Now, if a wild animal owes their existence to a certain policy that brought them about, do they really have grounds to complain that this policy is also causing them some pain and suffering? That's the non-identity problem. Um, I won't be able to explore all the solutions to that problem here, although Duncan and Ben Hale have a, a pretty interesting paper about how this uh, uh, problem can be applied to and solved in the context of animal populations, wild animal populations. Um, all I'll say here is that if, as the vast majority of people think, um, there is a solution available to us in the human case, most of those considerations are going to extend to the non-human case too. So if we think that we do harm future generations of humans, through policies that bring them into existence but also cause them pain and suffering. So we have reason to have policies that make things better rather than worse, even though the populations will be different. Then we should think the same thing for roughly the same reasons in the case of wild animals too. Um, and I'm happy to talk about that more later. But that issue is lingering in the background here. Another one which I've already emphasized is the repugnant conclusion. This is also a term that Eric Parfit came up with. Uh, here the question is, um, do we care more about total or average levels of well-being in the world? And this question is directly relevant because, as we've seen, there is a very real chance that climate change could result in greater total but lower average levels of well-being among wild animals if their lives are good on balance, or the reverse, if their lives are bad on balance. Now, many utilitarians think that we should bite the bullet and accept that the greatest amount of total well-being is what we should be aiming for, even if that means a world with trillions of individuals whose lives are barely worth living. Up until now, that's been mostly a thought experiment. But that could genuinely be the case, depending on how we answer some of these other questions. It might be, and I hate to say this because I am one of them, that a total utilitarian should think that <coughs> climate change will produce a world with lots and lots of flies, and they have lives barely worth living, uh, and that does create a greater aggregate amount of expected well-being, then maybe I need to bite the bullet and commit to that being a desirable world. 
that keeps me up at night. Uh, I would like to figure out how to avoid that issue, but for now I want to recognize it as a real issue that we need to be thoughtful about. But of course there are similarly repugnant implications of saying average well-being is what matters because maybe then we should wipe out wildlife <coughs> populations or just create the flying squirrel planet or whatever. Um, so that's a very significant issue that we need to be focusing on too. Um, the last one I'll, I'll just note, this also came up in Mark's talk, uh, it, there are questions about discount rates, about how much to value distant future lives in comparison with nearby future lives. I'll just note that the more we value nearby future lives relative to distant future lives, the more it will turn out we should be focusing on things like assisted migration, which benefit um, currently living animals and animals in nearby future generations as opposed to uh, investing in policies that will result in the right kind of population of wild animals in the long term. So which kinds of policies we focus on could depend on temporal discounting issues. Okay. Thank you. Oh. Hang on. No, I'm not. Okay, sorry. I was gonna, I, thank you. I got, I got five minutes left, but you're welcome to thank me yeah, during my talk, too. <laughs> I'd love to start that convention with my talk here uh, sorry, right now. No, you're, you're welcome. Um, <laughs> so let me, let, me, let me just take uh, four minutes to, to uh, uh, talk about the final cluster of issues that come up and are looming over this entire discussion, because I think a lot of people Maybe, maybe not people in this room as much because you've been immersed in these issues, but a lot of people, I think, when they hear all this information at once, have a tendency to feel kind of overwhelmed. And this is part of what pushes them away from wanting to take seriously the possibility that we could have significant moral duties related to climate-related wild animal suffering, because if climate change uh, is, is a sort of perfect moral storm, then climate change impacts on wild animals, and our complicity in that is like a perfect moral zombie apocalypse or something, <laughs> some, some ramped up version of that. Um, so, so that raises questions about the limits of ethics and politics that we need to take very seriously too. Uh, so, so to briefly summarize those questions, there are theoretical questions about how demanding morality can be for individuals and for states. Is it possible that morality could require us to drop everything and devote our lives to many important moral issues, among which is how things go for flies five generations from now? Is that possibly something that uh, morality can require of individuals and states? Now, I think that the answer to that question, for reasons that many, especially consequentialists, and in particular people like Shelley Kagan have argued over the years, I think the answer to that question is frankly absolutely yes, not only for consequentialists, but also for rights theorists, given the scope of this problem and given our own complicity in this problem. But then there's a, a practical question about the limits of ethics and politics too, which is even if all individuals and states act rightly, will that be enough to solve the problem? And there I think the answer is maybe no, for reasons that many people, including Dale Jameson, have been exploring lately, because this is a major global intergenerational collective action problem, and we could all do right by this issue, but still not actually affect the changes that we need to affect. Now this is why, for 40 years or so, environmental ethicists have been saying, we need a new environmental ethic. We need a new ethic that can be adequate to meet the challenges that we are going to be facing in a world where the main moral challenges are characterized by this global intergenerational collective action structure. Um, there's nothing I can say in one minute about what that new morality and that new politics should be, but I will point out that even though at the critical level as a criterion of rightness, I personally do, um, with apologies to some of the people in this room, think an individualist approach is the correct one. It might not be the right approach to use at the intuitive level, decision procedure level, in order to actually deal with these issues. We might need to try to transcend our individualist morality and look to a more holistic or collectivist morality in order to really grapple with these changes in a coordinated way. That might be possible. As far as politics goes, uh, Dale Jameson is working on a book right now and some articles about the limits of liberal democracy when it comes to these issues. Because liberal democracies function to promote individual freedom 
and do what the collective wants to do. And promoting individual freedom and doing what the collective wants to do is probably not going to be compatible with worrying about flies 500 years from now. So we need to figure that out too. Um, now, that all is truly overwhelming. So I, I, I've not tried, of course, to solve any of these problems in this discussion. What I've wanted to do is motivate the idea that we do have strong, at least prima facie, moral duties related to resisting animal agriculture and assisting wild animals at least when it comes to climate-related uh, uh, wild animal suffering. Um, but I've also, and I think this has been where some of the pushback to other talks that have advocated for this uh, uh, has, has been coming from, acknowledged that there are very substantial obstacles that stand in the way of our doing that in an accurate and effective way, um, including scientific challenges and philosophical challenges. So that could lead people to think, well, there are so many things that are bad in the world, maybe we should focus on the things that we have a little bit more of a grasp on, um, or maybe we should wait, wait for more information to come in before we make an informed decision about this. I think that is absolutely the wrong conclusion to, to draw from feeling a little bit overwhelmed by how all of these issues interact and our ignorance uh, about a lot of these issues, because of course, this is a massive problem. We are likely never going to have enough information to be able to very confidently know what we should do. But in the meantime, the climate is already changing and wild animal populations are already being systematically affected. And so I think that we will need to figure out whether and when we should start to take action, um, even though we are not as confident as we'd like to be about what in particular we should be doing. And, and exactly how to strike that balance is a hard thing. Fortunately, there are some first steps that we can take that will make sense no matter how we answer many of these questions. So in particular, thinking that we should at least be committed to resisting animal agriculture and assisting wild animals in some way, shape, or form is a safe, tentative conclusion to be drawing. And then moreover, saying that the first steps we should take in these processes are uh, a, extending moral and political standing to all sentient beings, and B, researching alternatives to animal agriculture and interventions in wild animal suffering. Um, those are things that will make sense for us to do no matter how we answer many of these further questions. What we need to be doing is laying the groundwork uh, practically and epistemically, practically by extending political standing to all animals, so that we can have the, the power to uh, get rid of animal agriculture and assist wild animals if and when we decide to, and then epistemically doing the relevant research so that we have the know-how that we need uh, if and when the time comes. Those are things that we should be doing now and that will require substantial time and energy and other resources. Um, so, so that is what I'd like to convince people that we should be at least starting on, which I think is something that many of us have, have agreed on at least that much. So I'll stop there, and I'll be happy to discuss more of any of these issues in the q &A. Thank you. Thank you. So we have about half an hour for questions. Angie, and then you over there. Um, yeah, um, thank you for the talk. It was very interesting, and there's lots I could say. I guess the first thing, just a minor point. Sometimes you talk about it as though it's like, Humans are one category, and animals are another mm -hmm. category that face the potential harms of anthropogenic climate change, and we need to figure out the implications <coughs> for both groups separately. And I guess I just would like to see humans as animals, right, <laughs> as part of the, the group. Does that have a panic tomorrow? By the way, I'd love to write down what people are yeah. saying. Oh, great, thank you. Thanks. But the second point, and I guess like, I don't want something to bang the same old drum over and over again, but when you talk about a duty to resist and a duty to assist, what exactly do you mean by duty here? Mm -hmm. And who is that duty owed to? Um, mm -hmm. Because given your utilitarian bent, it would seem, well, I guess I'm just not really sure what the nature of this moral duty is. Yeah, that's a great question. So um, to, to briefly answer both of your questions, uh, first of all, I completely agree that humans are animals and we should be disrupting the human, non-human, the animal divide as much as we can. I did, for convenience, talk about non-human animals as animals 
in this talk, in the book, I plan to be a little bit more nuanced about that. So I completely agree with you there, and, and I want to be mindful of that. Um, the second issue is, is kind of an interesting practical question for me, and I'd love uh, more feedback about this. I am a utilitarian, um, though, though I feel uncertain about how to answer some of the questions that I raised in the talk. But I also want to write the book in a somewhat ecumenical way, where I construct arguments that can be appealing to people who accept different kinds of moral frameworks, and then use language somewhat generically so that it can be plugged into those different frameworks. So I guess I meant to be using duty ambiguously, such that it could be plugged into a consequentialist understanding, or a rights theorist, or a contextual relational theorist understanding of what that term means. When you were speaking, you used the language of reason. Mm -hmm. I did. And that yeah. might be better for you if you want to. Interesting. Yeah, when I was talking about strength of reason, for example, in the population ethics section, I switched to reason talk because uh, uh, linguistically people have an easier time talking about reasons as coming in degrees or different strengths than duties. Uh, with duties, that really depends more on your moral framework, whether they, they come in different degrees or strengths. Um, and then I switched to duties talk when I really wanted to make it clear that there's a strong moral consideration in play here. Uh, but I should sharpen that up too. Thanks for the suggestion. Um, first, I'm not sure that including robust duties to both negatively and positively in health animals introduces this new fact of impossible magnets. I think you already had impossible magnets mm -hmm. to human problems. Mm -hmm. You could argue that a room of two people in it already has a situation, but there's impossible to satisfy moral demands, and that's only a problem if you think that perfectibility or satisfiability is a part of morality. I mean, there's a lot of moral, very old moral systems that say it's impossible to satisfy and that's just the deal. Yeah. Um, secondly, uh, this idea of giving political standing to animals is, beyond all the other problems people can cite with that, I think is just really quite dangerous because they can't speak for themselves. And so they have standing someone has to speak for them. And so you are creating this vast resource of political legitimation in the context of local political crisis. And the forces best posed to further legitimate themselves by speaking for those are the incumbent ones, which I don't think we like very much. So like I I agree that like Formatively and practically, you can get a lot of traction by giving them standing mm -hmm. and serving their interests by plugging that standing into the standing serving mechanisms we already have. Yeah. But I think that's an extremely dangerous move. Okay, great. Um, so, so first of all, when it comes to demanding this, um, yeah, I think we're at, this is already a shitty world, and so morality is already demanding, um, and and this doesn't introduce demanding this so much as uh, maybe exacerbated, or at the very least, change uh, what we should be focusing on through all of the time, energy, and money that morality demands of us. Um, now, whether how how sort of disruptive this is for our previous way of thinking about what we should do, it depends on your moral theory of choice. Uh, consequentialists have thought for a long time that morality is demanding, and the only question has been what we should be focusing on in particular. Should it be global famine, or global poverty, or animal suffering, or more structural, systematic, political, institutional changes? But we ought to be spending uh, a, a vast amount of our, our time and energy money promoting one of those things, right? Um, so for consequentialists, it won't make morality much more demanding, but it might be surprising to discover that we should really be focusing on the flies who our, our uh, industrial activity will be impacting many generations from now. Um, that, that might be at least a surprising conclusion about what we should be focusing our energy on. Now, for rights theorists, though, I think it might introduce more demandingness than at least some rights theorists thought morality required of them. Because what climate change reveals is that we will be complicit for much more harm in the future than we arguably were in the past. Now, we were complicit in a lot of harm in the past. Um, but now, there's a way of, of um, looking at everything that happens in the world as at least partly a result of human activity. Um, and if we think that that is enough for us to be complicit in that activity, and then that, if we think that that changes this from a inaction to beneficent action choice to a 
maleficent choice versus maleficent action versus non-maleficent action choice, then that introduces a lot more demandingness for, for rights theorists and, and other people who, who adopt similar frameworks. With respect to political standing, this is an incredibly, obviously, complicated topic. And, and maybe thank you for reminding me <laughs> that even though that's a relatively modest conclusion, it's still an incredibly, uh, in many ways, ambitious and radical conclusion to say we should extend uh, political standing to all animals, including wild animals. Um, and I take your point, too, that there are really important practical obstacles in place of doing this responsibly. I mean, even in the human case, many humans have political standing, not the kinder as much as we should, but I don't trust my leaders to speak for me uh, or to make decisions that are in my best interest, and there's even more risk in the case of animals. So I take your point. Um, and people like Kim Smith have constructed really compelling arguments for the conclusion that sometimes when you extend rights to uh, a class of individuals, that can in a way harm them because it leads people to believe that we don't need to be paying attention to cruelty or harm to them anymore because political rights are protecting them. So it can sometimes lead to a step backward. In practice, we need to be attentive to all of that. At the end of the day, I do think that non-human animals, sentient non-human animals, domesticated, liminal, and wild, are owed political standing um, from both a consequentialist and a rights theory and other standpoints. And the arguments for that conclusion are familiar, um, but they go, you know, there are different ways in. Uh, Donaldson and Kimlicka focus, for example, on the way that liberalism and citizenship theory has shifted and incorporated insights from disability theory and so on. Uh, I think those are plausible ways of making that case. I won't review them all here. Um, but, but the core answer to your question, I think, is that we have, I think, decisively strong reason to extend political standing to animals, but that we can't do it in a thoughtless way. We have to do it in a way that's very attentive to the risks involved and that sets up the representation systems to mitigate those risks as well as possible. Yes, over there. At the back. Thank you. Um, I thought that was very compelling, engaging, and demotivating. Um, I, I want to pick up on a similar point. At one point in the paper, you said something like, animals have moral standing, so we should extend political standing to them, yeah. um, and we should recognize wild animal communities as political communities. Yeah. Um, I'm going to be critical. Please. Um, I'd be interested to know what kind of framework you're using for extending political standing, because mm -hmm. the, the fact that someone has moral standing does not equate to them having political standing. That, that just does not fall, it's not sector, um, on most moral frameworks. Um, and the second thing is, that when we talk about wild animal communities, we mean something very, very I think this might have been raised in a previous discussion session. Mm -hmm. We need to be very different from political communities. Um, the word communities, you, you, they're just different, different concepts, mm -hmm. I think. Mm -hmm. And so I'd be, I'd be interested to know how you are using that phrase there. Mm -hmm. um, because I'm, I'm, of course, on side with you to be extending political standing, but I think we need to be careful about extent how we ground political standing, how it differs from moral standing, and what that means when it comes to groups of wild animals. And I, I, if I was to use the word communities, it would be extended because <coughs> communities of wild animals are very different from the political communities we're talking about. Yes, great, thank you. Um, yeah, so, uh, so this is another part where I was trying to be a little bit intentionally vague or multiply ambiguous across different understandings of what this might involve, in part because I think we still have to do a lot of work in order to figure out um, how to extend uh, our current conceptions of political standing to the case of animals or um, create new conceptions of political standing that can apply to animals. Um, so, so I, I, I do think that if, if one has moral standing, then one ought to have political standing too. That's not to say one ought to be a citizen or member of any particular state. Um, uh, you know, as you know, of course, uh, the donaldson kimlicka framework is to regard domesticated animals as citizens, liminal animals as denizens, and wild animals as sovereigns. And then uh, the, the, the rough idea is to say that for that reason, domesticated animals should have roughly the same kinds of benefits or burdens within the state as citizens. Liminal animals should have uh, the diminished but, but still robust benefits and burdens relative to the state. And then wild animals should primarily have the same kind of autonomy or sovereignty that uh, other political communities should have, which means a general stance of non-intervention, 
but then intervention might be warranted in cases of crisis or when we have caused problems that we need to go and clean up, right? Um, I actually think something very roughly along those lines is plausible. Uh, I don't think that this project needs to be committed to that particular way of spelling it out. I think Donaldson and Kimlick are maybe a little bit too direct in the ways they draw inferences about how we should treat wild animals as political subjects based on how we should treat humans as political subjects. But that's understandable since they were basically creating a new literature with that book. Um, so the, the only thing that I want to insist on is that there's at least this much in common between uh, uh, sovereign political communities and the types of political communities that I imagine wild animals to uh, constitute, which is that in general we should perhaps uh, let them be, maybe, maybe not, we can disagree about that. Um, but in cases of crisis, and in cases of crisis that we are responsible for in particular, they have a certain kind of political standing relative to the state. The state has an obligation to provide assistance, not just individual members of the state, but the state itself has these obligations to these animals. That's the only thing that I care to insist on about what kind of political standing wild animals should have. And that I think is pretty plausible. Yeah. You had the back of there with your sure. yes. Um, yeah, so I want, so <clears throat> I brought up that you're a, a total utilitarian. So I wanted to talk about the epistemic issues. Yeah. So you sound, so you're a total utilitarian and you're fairly epistemically optimistic, I guess is how I would describe it. So we can make, we can generate good evidence um, about the effects of some future policies on aggregate suffering or something like that. If we put in the time and effort and resources. But, um, you know, there's this sort of common objection to consequentialist theories, which is that you should never really be epistemically optimistic about the net effect of your actions. And so James Lenman has this paper, Consequential Influencedness, right? So, you know, he has this example, um, you know, a bandit is raiding and pillaging the village, and he finds the final survivor, um, who he's thinking of killing, and uh, you know, but he has this blame of compassion, so he orders her life spared. But it might be that he shouldn't have done that by consequential standards, because um, we could suppose that her great, 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 so on grandson was Adolf Hitler. Yeah. Turns out he he did the wrong thing, and not only that, but. You know, given his best evidence, um, given sort of whatever infinite time horizons, whatever evidence he did have with respect to that value would be dwarfed mm -hmm. by his ignorance. Mm -hmm. And it seems like many of our decisions, especially ones that involve appropriate effects, might ramify that in a way that leads to a similar kind of yeah, that was concern, particularly for that. Yeah. So I'm just curious what you say to that kind of word about this. Yeah, so, so I, um, that's, a, that's a great question, and I think it's a really important challenge for consequentialists, and especially globalized consequentialists. There are many issues with consequentialism that I find to be pretty persuasive. I think demanding this objections require a lot of attention, cluelessness objections require a lot of attention, the repugnant conclusion. The stuff about diversity of experience from earlier in this conference, I think, requires a lot of attention. <coughs> so I accept it because I think, on balance, this is the, the best theory, and there are plausible answers to these questions, even if they might not be wholly intuitively satisfying. When it comes to cluelessness, I think there is a genuine empirical question about precisely how clueless we are. Um, Jameson and others, for example, think we are so clueless that we actually do more harm than good when we attempt to predict things in the future and then act accordingly. Now that also requires a certain kind of confidence in his predictions about the future effects of our actions, but we can set that aside. Um, whereas other people think, no, there are a lot of challenges here, uh, but our best efforts to collectively marshal 
um, our, our sort of intellectual resources to figure out how to go about solving these global problems is better than chance. It's better than flipping a coin or doing whatever the hell we want. Um, I tend to be at least confident enough to feel like that might be true. <laughs> yeah. And uh, <laughs> yeah. So, but I think this is among the outstanding questions that we need to answer in order to get a grip on what we should be trying to do here. Um, so, so people like uh, Wilfred Beckerman think that for uh, this reason and other reasons, even if we do believe that we have very strong duties to future generations, given the limits of our ability to predict what they will need and provide that for them, um, we should focus our energies on just creating a more just and decent society for them to inherit so that they can identify and solve their own problems with those resources. So if a certain degree of pessimism turned out to be right, then I would think we should throw everything we have into doing that kind of thing. Though that could still involve structurally shifting things so that animals have political standing and we have more opportunities for helping them. Um, so it'll change how we discharge our duties, but not that we have those duties. Great. Uh, I'll pass. You're pass. Okay. Uh, yes. Um, so I'm not a pragmatist, but I'm about to play one. Okay. Great. Um, uh, so in this talk, you say you know we need to answer challenging questions about the of well-being and population ethics, not just what men in this stuff. Yeah. And one of the questions I had is really need to answer those questions. Because mm -hmm. those are all questions that come up in the case of people. Mm -hmm. um, and we haven't answered those questions. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't mean we haven't made any progress <coughs> in the Millennium Development Goals, and poverty to a specific extent. So I'm wondering sort of what you think the role of settling some of these philosophical issues is in the sort of practical project. Yeah. That's a great question. So so I think um, I, I need I need to to develop my my thought about this a little bit more in order to, to fully answer it. I think the first step is gonna be unpacking everything enough so that we can see exactly which questions we need to answer in order for to make to, to take action on important policy initiatives. Because it might be that in some cases we can identify a plausible range of answers and if any one of those turns out to be true, we can move forward. That would be great. It might be with others, we really do have to answer this before we can move forward, and that would be interesting to know. Um, I do think, though, that even in the human case, uh, we need to answer some of these questions in order to know what to do. I mean, for example, <laughs> whether or not we think total or average well-being is what matters is going to partly impact whether we think there's too many or too few people on the planet. So Toby Ord thinks we don't in fact have overpopulation, we have underpopulation. We need more people. Um, we need more people because they add intrinsic value. Each person adds intrinsic value to the world. It also creates more intellectual resources for us to draw on. Um, if you go for a total utilitarian view or anything roughly like that in response to that population ethics question, that'll systematically change your views about procreation ethics and population ethics and many of the related policies. Things will be worse for everyone on average, but more people will get to at least have lives minimally worth living. Um, so I think even in the human case, we sometimes underestimate how important these issues are for justifying the policies that we support. Um, in the non-human case, I think it'll be similar. Okay. Um, you're next, yeah. yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm trying to think about to what extent you have responsibilities for what happens with sentient animals in the climate change world that we create. Yeah. And my, my general worry is that we put too much emphasis on human influence. We just think that what we do is so important, right? and, and we forget that nature still has a kind of overwhelming impact on the world and what's going on. And, and so, to try to get a little more practical, so, you know, in, in a climate change future, we might determine which predator is killing which prey, but we didn't create predators for prey, right? Nature, nature did that, and and so I would, yeah, we're complicit, but but does it really mean that we have responsibilities to do something about it to alleviate it? Because now we're, I mean, just I'm not, you know, or so this other example might work better for you, but you know, we shift things from K strategists to R strategists, mm -hmm. and now so different animals are dying. Or, suffering but 
we didn't make the different strategies in nature, we kind of shifted it. And so, are we really now responsible like we would be if we really went out and harmed somebody and then, yeah. I'm not. I'm yeah, I, th I, think, I think that's a great question. And um, when I have more space to, to talk about all these issues in more detail, I, I, I really want to explore that because I think you're absolutely right. Now, for a utilitarian like me, our complicity won't matter in the first place. What matters is that there is a certain kind of harm or suffering that um, with appropriately humble and cautious uh, research and so on, we may or may not be in, in the position to alleviate a little bit. But for most other people, this stuff is going to matter a lot. And I think you're absolutely right that um, even if the world is reshaped by human activity, the causal chains are going to be very different in different situations, and that may matter for some people. Uh, so for example, at one end of the spectrum, um, if a seemingly climate-caused hurricane is uh, uh, completely destroying some local area and making life impossible for wild animals there, then, then one might think the causal chain is, while still very indirect, as Jameson will remind us, direct enough so that we can say climate change is the sort of primary cause of this issue and we are complicit in that so we should, should help these individuals. But when it comes to other things, like the mere fact that different predators are hunting different prey because climate change has affected who exists and where and when they exist, um, then our, our causal influence is more remote, less of a sort of primary cause and the harm that's going on. Um, and, and I think some people with some moral frameworks might want to draw a line there. And I think it'll be an interesting question on what grounds they draw that line and where they draw that line. Um, but I'll say, briefly, that this is part of where the non-identity problem comes up. Because one of the things that is going on here is that um, even if we didn't invent R and K selection, even if we didn't invent predators and prey, uh, the particular individuals living in these dynamics are going to um, be a partial result of our activity. And so our answer to the non-identity problem is going to affect what we think about this. But I, I agree that um, that is an important issue, and not everybody will go along with me because the causal chain might be sufficiently remote for them. And you yourself said that you wanted you wanted to put emphasis on climate change, yeah. human caused climate change, because that did make us yeah. responsible. Right? You wanted to yeah. push it. That that's also why I wanted to restrict my argument to climate related wild animal suffering, and it might be that depending on your moral framework you pick out a different class of animal sufferings as climate related than I do, right? Um, if you think the causal chain should be more direct, then it'll be a narrower class of animal sufferings that you think you have an obligation to intervene in for these reasons. We have two more questions. You over there and then Greg. Okay. Um, so my question is, can you just briefly explain what our strategy and case strategy are? Mm -hmm. And you made like, a slight joke about it at the beginning, or uh, something that we shouldn't be taking seriously, or we should. Uh, uh, so just first elaborate on that. Got it, sure. Oh, sure. Um, yeah, so, so uh, that, that was because it came up in a couple of other sessions. So, so basically, um, these refer to two different types of reproductive strategies. The truth in the world is much more complex, but this is maybe a useful heuristic to keep in mind for certain, uh, certain purposes. Um, our strategy refers to a reproductive strategy that emphasizes quantity over quality. So in our strategists, like small rodents and insects, will have very many babies, not invest much parental labor into their babies. Um, the babies then, most of them die, but some of them live. They have short uh, lifespans. They reproduce again, and, and some survive, and, and that's our strategy. K strategy um, emphasizes quality over quantity. So this is larger mammals, for example. Um, they have a small number of children, but then invest a lot of parental labor into those children. Fewer of them proportionally die, um, but they take longer to grow up and come into sexual maturity and reproduce, and they have longer lifespans, larger bodies, too. Um, so our strategists are more resilient in radically changing environmental circumstances because they can reproduce more quickly and have more kids and so they, they fare a little bit better in the aggregate. I made a joke because in a previous session um, Oscar said that even though he's partly responsible for the resurgence of the use of these terms in this literature, he's now persuaded that because they're subject to a lot of criticism in the relevant other literatures, we should be moving away from them so as to not make these points in distracting ways. <laughs> 
Um, and just to follow that up then, uh, you talked a lot about how you are a total utilitarian. I uh, wanted to ask if you consider incorporating uh, the greatest happiness principle into your own ethical standpoint, and would this be a way to uh, perhaps distract from having to have a moral consideration for uh, flies five generations from now, whether or not if they were in like a kind of roasted ozone layer, would, that, would they be happy, and are other sentient life forms like flies or insects would be capable of that? And then applying the greatest happiness principle with that somehow help you focus who you owe moral considerations to? Um, yeah, it, it, would sharp, it would sharpen things because I am trying to talk about things in a somewhat general and ecumenical way. So if I focused on utilitarianism, as a matter of terminology, I take the greatest happiness principle to be equivalent to total utilitarianism. So, so it is incorporated in the kind of utilitarianism that I accept. But it won't by itself answer all these questions and solve all these problems because we still face questions about whether flies and other invertebrates are sentient, they experience phenomenally conscious pleasure and pain. If so, how much do they experience relative to other animals? Are their lives net good or bad? Those are philosophical and empirical questions that merely accepting uh, total utilitarianism won't answer for us, and so there's still going to be a lot of issues that we face. Okay, great. I wasn't going to ask about it, but uh, since Ned brought up um, the R versus K selection thing, mm -hmm. um, I think I need a bit more convincing that we should expect climate change to increase the proportion of R strategists versus K strategists. You mentioned one reason to maybe be uncertain about that, and that is because um, K strategists are often generalists, mm -hmm. which would make them maybe more adaptable. Yeah. But just to throw out a case, yeah. um, <clears throat> the case of the Atlantic cod in the Gulf of Maine, which was something that uh, Oscar talked about and that I uh -huh. responded to in, in, my, uh, in my talk, he used that species as an example of, of an R strategist. And the thing about Atlantic cod is they have collapsed because mm -hmm. of human impacts and they haven't yeah. managed to recover, even though we've stopped fishing them. So at least you know that that's a case of an art strategist that was not very resilient to, yeah. to uh, human impacts, and so I guess I just need more um, convincing that we should expect this kind of shift. Oh yeah, I think we all need more convincing. I I, I don't feel confident in that prediction. Um, I, I mentioned that as well as the other one as examples of predictions that we could plausibly move in the direction of making with more research. But but the current state of the research is is pretty all over the place, as we saw in a previous session where some people are looking at research that says that the total numbers are going to go up in a world reshaped by climate change because there will be more cold regions that are turned into tropical regions and so on. And then there are other people who are noting that at present um, numbers of wild animals are going down and extrapolating from that into the future. So I think things are just in a really um, uh, un unclear place right now. Uh, but, but with that said, you know, it does seem plausible to me that even though there are, of course, going to be many counterexamples on all sides, there will be many R strategists that go extinct, many K strategists who survive, um, many adaptive generalists who go extinct, many niche specialists who survive. Um, there are going to be all sorts of anecdotes that, that seem to disconfirm it, but um, I'm thinking mostly in terms of general population level trends that could arise over the course of many generations of, of this, this uh, climate-related activity. And there it does seem plausible to me, though I'm not a scientist, I'm a philosopher, and I'm relying on other people to tell me what to think about this. Um, it does seem plausible to me that in the aggregate we could see a push in the direction of more R strategy and a push in the direction of more adaptive generalists, even though to some degree those trends will push against each other. Um, but I'm open to being persuaded that that's false. This is one of the many important issues that will just totally change what kind of approach we think we should take to this issue. Uh, along with all the normative ones. It makes it complicated, but we should try to figure it out as best we can. Let's thank Jeff. <laughs>